A Fox News host wrote the cancel culture dictionary and surprise, it blows. Now first off, hi, hello. Sorry I haven't posted a long video in forever. For the last seven months, I have been living out of a suitcase, not in a sad way. I've been visiting friends, I went to Argentina, I hung out with my mom, but now I have an apartment again, and a couch, and my painting, and like 50 unhinged scripts I've written over the last half year. Like this one. Now this book's full title is The Cancel Culture Dictionary, An A to Z Guide to Winning the War on Fun. Which kind of confused me because there's a chapter about R. Kelly, although I suppose technically he's He's not fun. This poorly written, completely brain dead masterpiece was penned by Fox News host Jimmy Fela. That name might not be familiar, if so, love that for you. But I basically describe him as the new old Greg Gutfeld, which makes sense. The similarities are uncanny. They're both painfully unfunny, yet are self-proclaimed comedians. They both look like eggs. Neither of them can dress. And as of January, Fela has taken over Greg's old Saturday night time slot. The only real difference between Jimmy Fela and Greg Gutfeld besides their height is Fela used to be a New York City cab driver, which he will tell you if you let him speak for more than five seconds. As you know, I am a former New York City cab driver. As a former New York City cab driver, as a former New York City cab driver, as a former New York City cab driver, I am a former New York City cab driver, and I think I've that's, never heard that before. But, but yes, that quirk does carry over into his writing. Now, I've been looking forward to reviewing this book ever since I saw the table of contents, where there was a chapter titled, quote, Cosby, Chappelle, and CK. But the entire table of contents is a mess. I mean, all of the chapter titles are dumb. They're like two to five words. Washington and Wilson, Mascot Mayhem, The Kelly Files, which I'd like to remind you refers to R. Kelly. But then you get to N, which apparently stands for Neil Young leads an attempted COVID coup on Spotify. Catchy. Now, just like its table of contents, the rest of the cancel culture dictionary is um, bad. It tries to be social commentary, but just sounds like whiny cringe. And then it also tries to be funny, but all of the jokes are hackneyed reruns. I'm being totally serious. There are maybe five original jokes in this entire book. To be fair, five original jokes to someone who watches Fox News as her job. Like this is a personal problem and one of the worst parts of reading this book for me. I kept reading a punchline and then turning into the Leonardo DiCaprio meme because I'd remember when he'd use that on like Laura Ingram's show six months ago. But once again, that's, that's a me specific issue. In the end, this book comes off as more out of touch than anything else. You know that guy that shows up to open mics and only brings transphobic jokes and then gets really mad when no one laughs? Yeah, combine that with all of the lamest parts of Fox News, put it into 224 pages, and you've got the cancel culture dictionary. I mean, this is one of the first lines of the book. It was a simpler time when Reagan was president and fun was legal. I will give Jimmy Fallon credit where credit is due. He definitely wrote this book because there is not a single ghostwriter on this planet who can write the words, hey yo, there it is, pow, without offing themselves. I also know there will be conservative hate watchers and maybe even Jimmy Fallon because he seems like the kind of guy to name search who will instinctively want to comment, well, you bought the book and you read the whole thing. They're like, yeah. Have you looked at my channel? You know like my whole thing is critiquing conservative media. How is this surprising? So let's get into it. The Cancel Culture Dictionary, an A to Z guide to winning the war on fun is exactly what it says. There are 26 chapters. Each chapter is a letter that stands for something that has supposedly been canceled. When I was originally planning this video, I wanted to use like general themes because I thought it'd be lame to just go chapter by chapter. But the entire thing is so repetitive and whiny that I found the easiest way to do this is literally to go chapter by chapter. There are a few chapters that I just don't talk about because they were so utterly unremarkable, but I will be talking about everything in alphabetical order so you can skip around if you want. So the book starts with award shows, that thing that conservatives want to be invited to so bad that they created the Patriot Awards. Golden Corral and Camping World, thank you very much for sponsoring this event. Here's how the first chapter starts. Hollywood awards shows used to get incredibly high ratings, but these days the only thing high at the Oscars is Seth Rogen. Heyo, I've got a million of them people. I hate this book so much. The meat of this chapter focuses on the eligibility requirements for the best picture at the Oscars. Fela was really smart about this because he points out something that I didn't think about. There's no criteria for being a good actor or having a great script. When he's right, he's right. I can't believe they don't require that for best picture. The climax of this chapter is one of the most beautiful, most idiotic, uh, one joke examples I've ever seen. If The Godfather was being made today, the only way it could win Best Picture is if Marlon Brando started identifying as the Godmother and made somebody an offer he couldn't hear. It goes without saying that when Sonny got shot up at the causeway, at least half the mobsters would need to be women of minority descent. And given all their Second Amendment bashing, it's likely the iconic line of, 
leave the gun, take the cannoli, would be shortened to just leave the gun. For all we know, the cannoli came from one of those bakeries that doesn't support gay marriage. It is astounding how he is able to make the same joke like six times in a row. Now the letter B stands for broadcasters, and while this chapter is kind of uneventful, it shows something that Fela does a lot in this book. The chapter focuses on two different broadcasters who made incredibly racist remarks. And Fela admits that. He says that there's no place in society for remarks like this, but then he waffles. Were they really being racist or were they just being stupid? And I think Fela should have to actually answer this question considering he is trying to write the book on cancel culture, but he doesn't and he never does. Now it's time to talk about C, Cosby, Chappelle, and CK. To be clear, Fela does say that Bill Cosby deserves to rot in prison. Like that is something that he is very firm about. But the way this chapter is framed is just so weird. First off, if I wanted to defend Dave Chappelle, which I don't, I wouldn't sandwich his name between two sexual predators. Although to be honest, I don't think Fela thinks Louis C.K. is a sexual predator. Here's what he says. Society was quick to side with his accusers in the midst of all the Me Too mayhem. And although CK issued a rare apology, fully owning the behavior, the fury was so intense that there were no defenders left to stick it out for him. Some pun intended. To be clear, Louis's behavior was disgusting. That being said, I'm not gonna sit here and shame the guy all these years later because the amount of shame you must feel to ask a woman to watch you shake hands with the governor is a lot harsher than anything we can throw at him anyway. Actually, no, it's, it's not. I mean, first off, he didn't feel any shame. That's kind of the entire reason he was a sexual predator. And second, it's not harsher than anything we can throw at him because he's still performing at Madison Square Garden. Fela ends this chapter with a very muddled joke about how laughter is a better medicine than anything Dr. Huxtable would prescribe, which is why we should defund the joke police and go look for the real criminals. I hate this book. The D chapter talks about Dr. Seuss, which is a culture war narrative from three years ago. Fela says that if Seuss wrote his books today, they would be called Cage Free Eggs and Impossible Ham, and oh, the places you'll go as long as you're vaccinated. The free speech section is a lot of fun. You can tell that Fela thought he was being really smart when he called elections the ultimate form of cancel culture. I think he forgot that the entire premise of his book is cancel culture bad. He also admits that cops can't get laid and then says this, all of us, whether we're cops, cab drivers, cable news hosts, you name it, shouldn't be living in fear that our jobs can vanish over a joke or an unpopular opinion. Okay, first off, you're, um, you're two of those, so it kind of feels like you're just talking about yourself. But also, if you're a cop and hold an unpopular opinion, like say, um, white people are better than black people, I do want your job to vanish. You should not have that job. But then again, I'm a triggered leftist snowflake. The I chapter, which stands for influencers, was actually kind of interesting. Fela doesn't sound like your typical Fox News boomer. He recognizes influencers as a reality that's here to stay. But of course, all of that is just a preamble for the real topic, Bud Light. Well, more specifically, Dylan Mulvaney. In this chapter, Fela swears that conservatives didn't hate Dylan Mulvaney because she's trans. It's just because they've been seeing too many trans people lately, which is different somehow. Also, he laughs at his own joke. He does this so much and it is excruciating to read every single time. The JK Rowling chapter is exactly what you think, the typical turf apologia, but it's in this chapter where Jimmy Fela answers a question that I was actually wondering, does he say the N word? And surprisingly, the answer is no. Fela says that he has zero desire to use the N word, which I would applaud even though it's like the bare minimum. But then he says he doesn't use the N word because he's not a rapper. I don't think your job is the issue here. Now, K stands for the Kelly Files, which I figured would be about former Fox host Megyn Kelly, but no, it's about the convicted pedophile cult leader, R. Kelly. I found this weird for a lot of reasons, uh, first of which, I don't really think he was um, canceled, but more tried and convicted for his many, many, many crimes. And Fela kind of touches on that, but he ends up giving credit to cancel culture. Here's what he says. It wasn't just the outrage mob who took R. Kelly down, it was the cops. Cancel culture meets handcuff culture. I don't really know what that means, but the word just implies that the outrage mob had a hand in R. Kelly's downfall, which in my head kind of undermines the entire book. 
but maybe I'm missing something. Just like when you're reading it, it's clear that about halfway through, Jimmy Fela hits a wall. The writing gets sloppier and a lot less involved. It feels like Fela just kind of brings up anything that matches a letter. Like for the letter L, Fela combines racist logos, uh, how Abraham Lincoln was canceled, remember when that happened, and like 10 pages of propaganda into one chapter. Then he immediately follows it with mascot mayhem, which is of course very different from racist logos. It's also necessary to note that Jimmy Fela brings up feet pictures in this chapter, and it's not the first time. She shouldn't be yelling at old people. She should be selling them pictures of her feet. There are like eight pages about how we need to make office Christmas parties horny again. It's not even worth touching on. Q, however, is one of the dumbest, laziest cop-outs I have ever seen in my life. It is so clear that Fela could not think of anything that starts with the letter Q. I can come up with a few right now. I don't even care about cancel culture. Quentin Tarantino, Qdoba, The Country of Cutter, Quasimodo, uh, Quiznos, Quagmire from Family Guy, Quagsire the Pokemon. I'm just kidding, he's perfect. Instead of getting like an actual thing, we get this page about how the letter Q is canceled because of QAnon. Oh, and also because of the 1980s arcade classic Qbert, which took place in an intolerant time where there were only two genders and one joystick, when Reagan was president and fun was legal. This is just so fucking lazy. How did a publisher let this slide? If the Q chapter didn't make it obvious that Fela was losing steam, the next few are just a blur of nothing. We've got a defense of Roseanne Barr's racist Xanax tweeting, a shot for shot retelling of Will Smith slapping Chris Rock at the Oscars, Tim Allen, woke universities, Victoria a secret. It's so unbelievably boring. The W chapter, which stands for Washington and Wilson, is similarly dumb. And I would have skipped over it, except that it's about my alma mater, the George Washington University. So for context, for years, some students have wanted to change the moniker of the school from the Colonials to something else. Some people have also wanted to change the name of the school because George Washington owned slaves. Other students have wanted to change our mascot from this demonic George Washington to something else. There are a lot of different opinions. I don't think the name of the school is gonna change anytime soon, but also a lot of people at GW don't care. Because here's the thing, GW doesn't have any school spirit. When you're on the campus, it doesn't feel like a college. That's the whole reason you go actually, to be in the middle of DC and to be taught by active journalists and diplomats. So it's just extremely funny when conservative pundits get so worked up about this. Jimmy Fela also jokes about how bad our football team is, except there's one problem. We don't have a football team. That one's just like a Google search. There are three chapters left, but only two of them are even worth mentioning. The first is X, which stands for XXX, and the entire thing is pro-sex work. Like, I am completely on the same page as him. Fela talks about how unfair it is to fire teachers for past work in adult films. He even takes a little swipe at the Vatican, but then immediately ruins it with another shitty fourth wall break. You know, this chapter was still poorly written, but like overall, Jimmy, I'm completely with you on this one. You should talk about this on Fox. You might genuinely change some minds. I also have some positive things to say about the penultimate chapter. To be very clear, it's because I agree with the position. I still think the writing sucks and the jokes are bad. And the only reason I like this chapter and the one before it is because I agree with the position. That position being, Kanye West is a Nazi and I don't like Nazis. Which was a very brave stance for Fela to take. It does take him a bit to get there though. Like talking about the DEFCON 3 tweet, Fela tries to give Ye the benefit of the doubt, saying it might be a joke. Although he does admit that the Holocaust isn't a great punchline. Fela also insists that Ye's cancellation was quicker and more severe because he, quote, upset the Black Lives Matter apple cart, whatever that means. But once we get to the explicitly pro-Hitler stuff, Fela is completely off board. And he says something that is really interesting to me. He says it's clear that Ye suffers from mental illness, but then he writes this. I unequivocally support the companies who exercise their right to cancel Ye. Some people tried to frame it as an attack on his speech rights, but the truth is the First Amendment wasn't violated here in any way. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say that a company can't fire a spokesperson for expressing wildly controversial views that they don't agree with. The First Amendment is there to let us protest, criticize, call out our government without being imprisoned. Ye has not been jailed for his comments. He's simply sentenced to commercial death. And with this statement, Jimmy Fela has undermined the entire point of his book. Because by this logic, there are only three possible conclusions. Number one, there are opinions that deserve cancellation. For example, supporting Hitler. Number two, because companies can fire spokespeople and employees they disagree with, 
cancel culture isn't real, or at the very least, not a violation of the First Amendment. Very few of the people mentioned in this book went to jail, and we've all agreed that the handcuff culture, cancel culture combo for Bill Cosby and R. Kelly is a good idea. So what's the issue here? I mean, Roseanne Barr didn't go to jail. The company she was associated with didn't want to be associated with racist Xanax tweeting. The main consequence of cancellation is losing your job or future opportunities, and that is at the hand of companies. Number three, Jimmy Fail is a moron who relies on logical inconsistency to make a living. And in the end, logical inconsistency is what this book really boils down to. Yes, the jokes are bad. Yes, the writing is worse. But the things that make the cancel culture dictionary so dog shit are the basic logical flaws. No one could enjoy this book unless they are completely brainwashed on Fox News. It's the literary equivalent of elevator music for people who shot up cases of Bud Light. Which is like, fine, I guess. I mean, I'm obviously not the main audience. But these assholes are so adept at monopolizing narratives and pushing bullshit. And we keep falling for it. We keep prioritizing people who want the worst for the most vulnerable in our society. And when they lose their second, third, fourth, fifth chance, assholes like Fela are the ones that come to their defense, trying to put them back into a position of power. This isn't to say that false accusations are a myth. In a society that is as interconnected as ours, you're gonna have people who get unfairly attacked. And it's up to us to try to make things right when they need to be fixed. But it's not everyone else's fault when the majority of people disagree with you. And it's not everyone else's fault when the majority of people don't find you funny. And it's not everyone else's fault when a majority of people think you're a dick. I watch conservatives work and make fun of them for pleasure. You can find more of my work on TikTok and all the other sites listed in my link tree. If you haven't already, like and subscribe and turn on notifications if you really want to impress me. I got a lot of fun videos coming up. Thank you for watching this one. See you next time.